everyone worships. Sure, not everyone wants to call it worship or even think about what they're doing. But everyone worships something. Everyone has some ultimate thing that they center their life around. Something or someone that they hope will give their life meaning or purpose. For some, it's religion. For others, it's money. For some, it's fun. For others, it's success or power. Or science or knowledge. Or beauty. Or popularity. For some, it's love or sex. For some, it's their family. But the Bible says, all things were made by Jesus and for Jesus. This means we were created to worship, but there is only one who is really worthy of our worship. That's why nothing else in this world satisfies. We keep on looking, we keep on striving, we keep on buying, but nothing delivers. Nothing brings us that deep satisfaction that we long for. But when you live your life with Jesus as the center, you're doing exactly what you're created to do. You're right in the place you're supposed to be. So the irony is that when we give our lives over to worship Jesus, that's when we actually find ourselves. Everyone worships, but we were made to worship just one. Everybody worships something. No matter what it is, if it becomes our ultimate concern, that thing that is in front of us that we desire the most at any given moment, we worship something. As we come to the end of our Lenten season, we, we've been looking at some of the spiritual disciplines that Christians can use to deepen their faith. We've looked at self-examination and confession of reading the scriptures and we've looked at prayer and today we will continue our series as we consider worship and ask what is worship for us what are our priorities in worship good morning uh, welcome to Sunday worship at Christ Lutheran Texas I'm pastor Mark Rose and I'm so glad that you're with us whether you're here in the flesh or you're watching online. Uh, we invite those who are watching online to continue to follow the worship words and song lyrics as they appear on your device. Later, we will gather around the table and hear the words of promise in which Jesus offers himself to us in bread and cup, and we trust in his promise and presence that, he, that his presence is extended from here and into your home. As always, we begin our worship by joining our voices and confessing our faith. So I invite you to stand as you are able. And, oh, we, I'm sorry, we begin with a song. Let's start with a song.
Now we join our voices together and we confess our faith, saying, We believe in God the Creator, who made us and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's love and truth revealed, who teaches us through story and life, who reveals God's love lifted on the cross, who was raised from death and redeems all that could be. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who calls us together with God and God's people, who guides and sustains and creates in us faith and makes us his church to serve and to heal and to make all things new. Amen. We gather this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. During these purple days of Lent, as we make our way to Calvary's Hill, we call to worship and remember that we are to return to God, for God is gracious. We confess to God, for God is merciful. We repent to God, for God is slow to anger. Praise be to God, for God abounds in steadfast love. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church and for the world and for all those in need. Oh God, you wash us through and through and you remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness in every place. 
Give your people courage to proclaim your loving grace to all in need, that they might discover new possibilities for their lives and for the world. You fill the earth with all that we need. Help us hear your call and tend to your will for all of creation. You promise to write your law on our hearts, guide leaders throughout the world to shape and govern communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace. Bless our president and all others elected to lead. Bless those who come in our times of crisis, those who protect us from chaos and crime, and for those who labor for peace in the world, and especially those who do so in positions and places of peril. Oh God, you sustain us with your spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence, those who are lonely, those who feel the weight of guilt and shame, and those who grieve, as well as all who struggle in mind, body, and spirit. Hear our concerns, O Lord, as we offer them silently or loud at this time. Jesus calls us to follow him in death and life. Empower this congregation in discipleship. Equip, equip your servants in this place to teach and worship in spirit and truth. In the cross of Christ, your name is glorified, and we praise you for those you have given to us for a while and who now feast at your banquet table that never ends. We entrust ourselves in all of our prayers to you, O faithful God. And we ask these things in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Uh, before we begin, there's a clipboard going around uh, asking for your email address, and that email address is if you don't already receive um, the weekly update, we're trying to update, keep that list updated. And for those of you that are watching at home, uh, if you don't receive the weekly update, whether you're a member or not, doesn't make any difference. We'd love for you to have that. So please just drop us an email. You can email me at pastormarkatchristbrenham.org or Mary Claire at christbrenham.org as well. And we, we'll make sure that you get the week, weekly update. Would you please pray with me one more time? Oh God, you call us together to be your people in this place and in other places. And, and yet during this changing time, we feel, we feel some uncertainty. Gather us in this morning that we might know your spirit in these words read and offered that they might grow faith in, in those who seek you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How would you finish this sentence? Worship is, you fill in the blank. Worship is, you know, I know that the easy answer might be, the easy response might be that worship is a, is a time when our church gets together and we sing songs and hear scriptures and a sermon and we pray a couple of times and, and we have communion and that's true. But I guess what I'm looking for is something a little deeper, maybe something that would include your experience of God and the Holy Spirit in worship. Uh, uh, maybe worship is our response to God's love for us, or worship is a longing for the building up of faith, or worship is necessary, or worship is a, a mark of discipleship. Worship is... In the words of the renowned theologian Karl Barth, worship is the mo most momentous, most urgent, most glorious action that can take place in human life. 
That's because it gets us ready for what is to come. The scholar and author Richard Foster says, to worship is to know, to feel, to experience the resurrected Christ in the midst of the gathered community. It is the breaking into the Shekinah or the glory of the divine presence of God or better yet, being invaded by the Shekinah of God. Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century Baptist preacher who was known as the prince of preachers in his time, said that worship is the highest eva- elevation of the spirit and yet the lowliest prostration of the soul. Dr. Leonard Sweet, who I guess I would call a church futurist, said about worship, forget the annual mission Sunday. Make every day a mission day, every worship service a mission service. In fact, worship services need to be precisely what they say it is, worship service. Dr. Robert Weber, the founder of the Institute of Worship, wrote, Worship stands at the center of the church's life and mission. It's the summit towards which the church moves and the source from which all of its ministries flow. It is the most important action the church is about. Worship informs the church's teaching, gives shape to its evangelicalistic mission to the world and compels the church towards social action. Worship is the context in which the true fellowship of Christ's body is realized and where those who participate can find real healing. That was a long one. The researcher of church trends, George Barna, said, For most Americans, worship is to satisfy or please them, not to honor or please God. Amazingly, few worship service regulars argue that worship is something they do primarily for God. A substantially larger percentage of attenders claim that attending worship service is something they do for personal benefit or pleasure. Hmm. The contemporary theologian and former bishop of Canterbury, N.T. Wright, said, about worship. It's the glad shout of praise that arises to God the creator and God the rescuer from the creation that recognizes its maker. The creation that acknowledges the triumph of Jesus the lamb. That is the worship that's going on in heaven in God's dimension all the time. The question we ought to be asking is how best we might join in. And of course, Martin Luther, the reformer of the church and the hero of our faith, said that worship is to gather with God's people in united adoration of the Father and is as necessary to the Christian life as prayer. Worship of God should be free at table, in private rooms, downstairs, upstairs, at home, abroad, and in all places by all people at all times. We should remember that Martin Luther wrote this probably at a time when most people, common people, didn't have access to true worship. And if you were to go to the website of the Evangelical Lutheran in Church in America, you would read, for Lutherans, worship stands at the center of our life and faith, a life of faith. Through God's word, water, bread, and prayer, we are nurtured in faith and sent out into the world, connected with And central to everything that we do, worship unites us in celebration, engages us in thoughtful dialogue, and helps us grow in faith. It grounds us in our Christian and Lutheran roots while demonstrating practical relevance for today's world. How would you finish the sentence, worship is? I should let you know that I did. But I have a tendency to be wordy and it was really long too long for now i invite you to send me your idea you can email that to me worship is but you should you should remember that it's easy for us to think of worship within our limited experiences it's informed by all the worship that we've experienced in our life and and maybe for some here your worship experiences Uh, might be limited to the worship that you've had only here, you've experienced only here, or maybe in Brenham. Or maybe some of you were Roman Catholic and then became Lutheran, and so that informs your worship. Or maybe some of you were Baptist, and that informs your worship. 
For others, it might be broader. In my life, I've had the blessing of worshiping in great cathedrals and in stadiums filled with thousands of people, as well as around a campfire with only a few. I've worshiped with uh, bishops of the church and with monks who worshiped privately in cloisters. I've worshiped with farmers and lawyers and teachers and homemakers and the privileged and the poor and even a drug addict or two. I've worshiped using ancient liturgies of the earliest church and liturgies created by great composers of the ages played out on, on majestic pipe organs as well as the simple strumming of a guitar. And I've worshiped with two or three present using only the words of our heartfelt prayers. I've studied worship, experienced worship, loved and even dreaded worship, just like some of you. And like you, I've been stirred in worship and awed in worship, bored to tears in worship. I've danced in worship and... Yes, I've even slept in worship, if I'm honest. And, all, and though all of these experiences have informed my notion of worship, during the past year, we've learned something new, something still uncertain for me as well as others, maybe you. For although worship has evolved over the centuries and even in our lifetimes, and though some of us still see worship only in certain patterns or orders of service or with a certain style of music or a message of hope delivered by a preacher or maybe the sacraments received in faith, though all of us may have different experiences of worship, for most of us there has always been one shared experience of worship. You see, most of us, for most of us, worship has always included the one that's next to you. Not just your spouse, maybe, but the one who's socially distanced from you. The one that's known or unknown. The one that's a visitor or a member, a seeker or a disciple. And yet a sister and a brother gathered together in worship, regardless of how and where. Our common experience has been that we worship together. But in this last year, we've learned a new word, live stream. <laughs> now, I know that broadcasting worship over the airwaves is nothing new. It's been happening for decades. But usually it meant that we were only being allowed to listen in or to peer in or to observe for a while, but not as those who are gathered there in that community together. Uh, the Greek word is ekklesia, the gathered or the assembly. And yet during the past year, we've had to learn something new. We've had to learn how to worship as the church apart from the gathering, apart from the one that's next to you. Now, the reason that I mention this is that because of the pandemic, the world has been forced into a new way to gather. And it may not leave us ever. That's the way change happens. But if you think about it, having this technology in some ways has been a great blessing. I mean, we still continue to have meetings and we could visit friends and family and go to classes. And yes, even worship has been available to us by this technology. I mean, imagine how isolated we would have, we would feel right now after this long year if we hadn't had this technology. But it also has its downsides. As we learned more and more about the spread of the coronavirus, we also learned that we actually missed being with others, uh, colleagues and friends and family and classmates and those who are gathered with us in worship. And still, we've also learned that even though less 
people have been present in worship during this past year, that more people have been worshiping than ever before? Or were they just watching? You see, I, I think that this change, whether consciously or without realizing it, has caused many of us to begin to think about what worship really is for us, for you and for me and for the church. I mean, is worship only worship when we're present together in the flesh? And if we do need to gather in order for worship to be worship, what about all those who've been viewing or engaging in worship online or at home? And if online worship is worship, do we need to gather? Do we need this big, big building? I mean, what is worship in this day and age, and how do we know? Well, my guess is that we really don't know yet, or at least not quite yet, about those who've been worshiping at home during this past year, about how many may return or not return. There is some data out there, but it's really too early to tell. So as we begin to turn the corner on this pandemic, or at least it feels like we are, I guess the real question or about worship is, what is worship for you? What is worship for us in this time of change? You know, if you're honest about it, though, you know that it's possible to gather, to be one worshiper in in a church that's filled with people and still never feel connected, never feel like you're worshipped. Instead, you're just present. And it's also possible for those who've been watching online to know and to feel that what they have been doing is worship. You know, when, um, when all of this started up early on, uh, there were some of us pastors out here in the hinterlands that were having a conversation with our bishop. And we, some of us had decided already that we were going to do we were going to do worship in the parking lot. We were, going to, we were going to serve communion as people drove out. And he struggled with that. It's not that he's bad or that he's wrong. He, he's just steeped in his own Lutheran orthodoxy. The idea that the Holy Spirit could actually make its way <laughs> from this table into somebody's home, I guess, was just a little beyond the book of Concord. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, then, and then I got this picture. I'm going to call them out. This is from the Apple Whites. <clears throat> Doggone it. That bread uh, was prepared by Avery and Autumn. on a Saturday, and the wine in those cups came from the grapes of their own vine. Tell me, tell me how that is not calling out to God to be present with, in, with, and under them in their own worship, in their own home. I sent that to the bishop. And so I've been wondering about this and maybe what it's like to worship online because, I mean, after all, I've been here the whole time. I've been on this side of the camera, you know, and sometimes there's a few people here, but most of the time it's just been me and the band and Landon and Candy, you know. I, I have watched our worship online mostly to critique us, but uh, I, didn't, I haven't tried what many of you have tried. And so... I was here. I felt like I was worshiping during that time. Even when no one was here, it still felt like worship. So last week I decided to try to worship online. And so I viewed a number of worship services from throughout the country, mostly Lutheran churches, to be fair, you know, if you're going to compare apples and apples, you know. And, you know, there were some that just did not feel like worship to me. They felt like I was watching. 
maybe it was because of my own critical eye, my judgments, or maybe they were still learning how to do this broadcast well, or maybe there was a lack of quality, or there, was, there were distractions that seemed to get away in the way of, of feeling like it was worship. And then I stumbled across a church worship service in Minnesota, and I was drawn in immediately. I found myself singing the songs, listening to the scriptures read. I was drawn into the prayers and even the sermon. I mean, it wasn't the best sermon I ever heard by any means. Still, all the pieces, all the components came together, and I knew that I was worshiping. So I continued to look around online, and finally it happened again and then again. And so I tried to identify that feeling that I had, that familiar feeling that joined me with the scriptures and the music and the prayers, that thing that made it feel like worship. And I think I discovered that what was happening wasn't just the technical quality or that it had been thought out that there was an intentional flow to the worship service or that the music was great or the scriptures that were read were done well or the or the or the relevance and delivery of the sermon all those things were important but there was something else you see i had discovered that what it made what made it feel like worship was in me it wasn't about me but instead it was that this desire that i felt to participate in what worship is meant to do, and that is to glorify God, to honor God. You see, I I think that for worship to be worship, it has to be about the act and attitude of glorifying and honor God. For worship to be worship, it has to be about the act and attitude of glorifying and honoring God. Christian worship then has to be about doing this in a way that leads, that leads us towards the cross of Christ. For although there's lots of reasons to glorify God, I mean, pagans and, and agnostics do this. We can celebrate the sun and the stars and the mountains and the seas. We can give thanks for loved ones and our life. But for us who claim and follow Jesus Christ, for us, worship must always be about God's love for us revealed in Christ crucified. And so it is for this purpose that we gather. It's for this purpose that we sing songs and hear scriptures read and and listen to a message of hope that moves us towards the cross. Because to do so, to worship the crucified and risen Christ is to give our whole whole selves over to him in this act of worship. As the apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the church in Rome, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. This is your true and proper worship. Again, in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, he says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We give ourselves in and through Jesus Christ to glorify God. And if you're wondering about this idea of glory, uh, the Hebrew understanding of glory uh, is found in this word kavod, the Hebrew word kavod. Originally it meant it meant uh, the weight of something. You know, you might go to the market and you wouldn't want to know about the kavod of this fish. But after a while, it began to move and began to mean just not only uh, the physical but figurative weight or importance of something. It began to mean respect and honor. If something was kavod, it was important, it was respected, it was honored, it had weight. It is the glory of God. So to give weight or respect or honor to God is to give glory to God. It is the kabod of God. And still, for us, it's even more because this glory, this kavod, must point us towards the redeeming work of Christ on the cross. So it's not about the components or the context of worship. It's about Christ in worship.
When Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well, you might recall that she tells him that she and her people worship God on this mountain. And he tells her that the hour is coming and is now here when true, worships, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. He's saying to her that the place no longer matters. It's the spirit and truth that matters. So you see, it is the spirit that leads us into worship. For the truth is that worship is not about us. Truthful worship is not so that others can see us worshiping. It's about the spirit leading us, even giving us the words when needed, so that we can worship in spirit and truth. To worship without sincerity is not worship because it does not glorify God. It is not the kavod of God. So more simply put, worship is the sincere and spirit-led act of giving glory and honor to God revealed in Jesus Christ. For people of faith, listen, for people of faith, this is a mark of discipleship. It is not an option. It is not an option. If you're a follower of Jesus, worship is not an option. It's not something that we do when it's convenient. It's something that we do because we give our whole selves over to Christ. And we do it because this is our response. Our response is worship. Over and over again in the scriptures, in fact, depending exactly how you define worship, whether it's to fall prostrate uh, on your face or to fall on your knees, worship is mentioned over 8,500 times in the scriptures. And the scriptures make it clear by example that God calls us together to gather, to be his body, his church for this purpose. In the earliest church, in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayers. It's clear that worship happens in community, in the gathering and the teaching and the breaking of the bread. It is the reason that Jesus creates his church on the foundation of faith, not only for those 12, but for the sake of the whole world. So are we to worship? Yes, like we breathe. And are we to do so in a community that's gathered? Yes, we should. Does the, worship, does the worshiping community happen when we're gathered virtually, online, or on television? Well, I guess my answer is, yeah, but it, just like those sitting in a pew, it's up to the worshiper. Are they, willing, are they willing to give their whole lives over to Christ for the purpose of glorifying God lifted up on the cross of Calvary's hill? Sisters and brothers, we've been living through extraordinary times, and that meant for us some extraordinary measures, some that may never change. And I have to tell you that I'm grateful that we have and will continue to gather through whatever means possible, including live streaming online. And yet it's important that I say this, especially to those of you who are at home. It is hard to be the church when we're away from one another. It's hard to experience the power of God's Spirit within a community to do what God has called us to do when we're not together. It's hard to love and care for one another when we become isolated and only watch worship for ourselves instead of gathering for worship to glorify Him in our worship and in our service. I know that we've only begun to learn what we will learn from this time that we've been going through. But one thing is for sure, we must worship. It's not really a choice for those who claim that Jesus is Lord. 
For our need is to give God all of ourselves so that we could glorify God together as his church. With all of our lives. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all our understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As you're able, please stand and we'll continue our worship together. this past year another thing that we learned is that it's easy to become distracted by this, the littlest thing that might draw our attention away from what it is that God is calling us to be and do as a community uh, I understand that and pretty soon we begin to get filled with all of that other noise and our priorities begin to shift and we begin to believe that these things are the most important things and we forget or we begin to believe what the scripture says is a lie. The scriptures tell us that if we believe those things, we're lying to ourselves and that the truth is not in us. But we've been given the blessing of confessing our sins through and by the grace of Christ so that we might know new life, know forgiveness and freedom from sin. And so as a community, we join our voices together and we confess our sin saying, Holy God, we confess to you and to one another. We so often fall short. We turn our backs when we could embrace. We remain silent when we could speak. We speak when we could listen. We close the door when we could knock. We judge when we could seek understanding. We keep when we could give. We turn away when we could follow. Forgive us, O oh God when we rely on our will instead of yours, when we seek the world's identity instead of yours, when we reject the person you made us to be, forgive us, O oh God, and make us new again. Amen. Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister in the church of Jesus Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sin, 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. You may greet each other with signs of peace, however that works out for you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Oh God, you are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth. For by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word, and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. And though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again, you drew us into your covenant of grace. And you gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice and mercy. And the coming of your son, Jesus Christ, who suffered for the salvation of the world, you reveal the glory and power of your love. Embracing our humanity, he taught us the way of salvation, loving us to the end. He gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin that we might rise and reign with him in glory. And so as we gather around this table, or wherever you may be, we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to his disciples saying, take and drink all of you. This cup is the new covenant, the new relationship in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Look with favor on your people. And in your mercy, hear the cries of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, free the oppressed, and fill your church with power. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with all your saints at the table of your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection and Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen, amen, and amen. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God given for you, the people of God. And all are invited. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
Christ is with us. He is with us. Break the bread. Taste the wine. Christ is with us. In this bread, there is healing.
Receive this blessing. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please pray with me. It is in this meal, these common things, bread and wine, and yet through faith in you, your true presence in us, that we turn to you in glory and give you all the honor of our lives. Use it to nourish us as we go out from this place and our lives might be examples of those given over to you in faith. Amen. Okay, a uh, couple of things that clipboard going around. If you already get the email, that's fine. If you haven't been getting it, there's either one or two things happening. You either haven't, we don't have your email address, or it's falling into your trash bin or your uh, annoying bin. If you know how to get it out of there, it's easy. If you don't, let us know and we'll help you get it out of there so that you'll continue to get it. It's important for that. For those of you that are watching online, we ask that you continue to like us uh, and subscribe. Also, share us. That's also helpful as well. And um, for those of you that are at home, uh, regardless of whether you're a member or not, I was, it was suggested that I was being a little too exclusive. So wherever you are, whoever you are, if you get something out of this and uh, you enjoy worshiping with us, you're welcome to give an offering. You can do so by either mailing it to us or dropping it off. Or if you go to our website, you'll see that green button just as those who are members and get the weekly update can go to the green button and give electronically. Those of you that are here, since we're not doing a traditional offering, we ask that you remember that the joy box is right out there in the narthex. Uh, it's coming soon. Monday, Thursday will be on the 1st of April at 6.30. Good Friday will be at 6.30 as well on the 2nd. And then on uh, the 4th is Resurrection Day. Easter morning, uh, we have services at 6.30 and 9.15. If you do receive your weekly update and you haven't opened it yet, please do. If you scroll down just a little bit, there's two questions that we're asking you. One is, if you're coming to Easter morning worship service, which one do you anticipate coming from? It's not a contract. We're just trying to get a head count. Uh, or if you're going to watch online or if you're not going to go to Easter service, and those people we're going to look for. So anyway, so just click one of those buttons. The second question is, how do you feel we're doing with these safety guidelines? I know, that, um, I know that for some, they can be restrictive. For some, they're, they're fine. For some, they're not restrictive enough. We're trying to find a balance as more and more of us become vaccinated, as more and more of us become more comfortable as we learn how to live with this for a little while longer, hopefully, that's it. But in the meantime, just answer those two questions. That would be really helpful to me. Um, on Easter morning, there will be two Easter egg hunts. Um, one at 7.45 and one at 10.15. That just gives us a little more space with more kids, that kind of thing. So please come to that. And if you have, um, if, you, if you're able, please drop off an offering that we can fill the eggs. With candy, there's a bin out there um, in the narthex. If you have prayers that you concerns that you would like to offer to us so that we can pray for you, uh, please email us at prayers at christbrenham.org. This is just the beginning of a prayer ministry that will continue to expand, but it's an easy way for you to access us and, and ask us for prayers. Lots of times people will tell me things on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, and I don't remember those things, so it, and then they write a note, and I don't know anything about it. So it's just best to email us if you can. And it, you don't have to be a member at Christ Lutheran to email your prayers. You can email us your prayers, and we'll certainly keep your, you in our prayers or what your concern is. Is there anything else? That's it? Oh, um, your thing was...
You can just pull up front and go and look at them. They'll be on the tables right in front of the day school. Thank you, Candy. Has anybody got a birthday today that's here? I didn't look. Anybody? Okay. I think that's everything. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We'll end with our last song as we send ourselves out of here. As you're able, please stand. Serve the Lord.